Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fourth uh, Ancient Attraction Lecture. Um, today, our lecture is um, by Dr. Mary Harlow. And until last year in 2021, uh, Dr. Harlow Mary uh, um, was Associate Professor at the University of Leicester. That was a position that she held from 2013 to 2021. Prior to this, uh, from 2011 to 2013, she was a guest professor at the Center for Textile Research at the University of Copenhagen. Mary's research uh, and her publications cover the study of dress and appearance, the history of age, aging and life process, uh, a life course, sorry, and also gender in the Roman period. So basically everything that's incredibly interesting. Um, Mary is a very prolific both writer and editor, and in recent years, uh, she has edited several volumes of um, a series by Bloomsbury called A Cultural History of. So they have a cultural history of dress and fashion in antiquity from 2017, which Mary uh, edited, a cultural history of hair uh, in antiquity from 10, 2019, and then a brand new one that came out in June this year, a cultural history of shopping in antiquity um, from 2022. And all of these uh, edited volumes come highly recommended, I should say. Uh, also of particular interest to our audience today, I think, uh, is the edited volume Textiles and Gender in Antiquity from the Orient to the Mediterranean, which was published in 2020. The uh, title of Mary's lecture this afternoon is Female Dress at Rome, Getting It Right. Uh, and in this lecture, Mary is going to examine the realities of wearing the Roman female wardrobe and discuss how we might investigate a woman's point of view when making clothing choices. So now I'm going to unpin myself and put a pin in Mary instead. And I'm going to pass the word to her and say, Mary, thank you so much for being with us. And the Zoom room is all yours. OK, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the UK. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and I hope very much that my talk will fit your brief. Now I'm, I start with a spoiler alert, female dress at Rome, getting it right. The answer is for a woman, practically impossible. Okay, so we'll start with that basis. And a lot of this lecture is more about the questions we might ask than about the answers. So as a Roman historian looking at dress, my primary evidence is limited to texts written by a very small group of elite men who are not really interested in writing about women, except in the polarizing opposites of Matrona and whore. So you either have the idealized wife and mother, or you have the prostitute, uh, the loose woman at the other end of the spectrum. We have iconographic evidence, which tends to follow similar lines in that it represents idealized virtuous women or genre pieces of fallen women. You may be familiar with the sort of drunken old woman of Hellenistic sculpture. But we do have archeological evidence of textiles, which, but unfortunately that is often uncontextualized or fragmentary. So the problem is we have these three branches of evidence and they don't speak the same language. The evidence they give us is often idealizing, it's fragmentary, it's regional, it's selective, and in a museum displays uh, and gallery displays, it's very static. And this is one of the most frustrating elements really. We have little sense of the experiential nature of Roman clothing or the ease of keeping it on the body or the choices women might have had the agency to make. So I'm gonna offer you some ways of looking at ancient dress. You may or may not agree with them, and some of them may be more time served than others, but I hope they will at least provoke some discussion. Particularly in my own research and my own travels, I've found analogies with ancient dress, Roman dress, and modern Indian dress and the wearing of the chador in Iran. I found these very productive in thinking about the possibilities of the ancient wardrobe and the body language required to maintain that image. So 
These are my questions for this paper, really. The idea of dress in action, this is a, a very interesting concept. Can we examine the realities of the ancient female Roman wardrobe? And the methodologies, how can we get there? Can we really imagine a female voice in a world where 99% of the writing and the commissioning of works was done by men and by a very small group of elite men? But can we, through a critical al analysis of representations, both literary and, I'm just going to remove this from my screen, that's all right, literary and visual, and using reconstructions, something I've come around to quite late in my career to access some of that reality. Now, I'd like to say at the beginning that my ideal of the Roman world, can you see my cursor moving? is 19th century hist Roman history paintings or history art. So this really is my, I've come from it from a very romanticized point of view. So I'd just like to state that at the beginning, but obviously I have moved on a little. And the other thing I've come very late to is textile archeology. span Now textile archeology span is, um, if you're talking about the experiential nature of Roman dress is something we really need to think about. I spent most of my academic life reading text, art, reading texts and looking at images, only to have most of what I thought I knew completely turned on its head when I discovered archaeological textiles. When I went to work uh, at CTR, suddenly a whole new side of Roman dress opened up to me. It made me think about materials. It made me realize that most of the Roman clothing in Italy was made of wool, some linen, and very surprisingly, given how much the ancient authors talk about it, very little silk. It also made me realize that color was very much part of the Roman wardrobe, particularly for women. The other thing I'd like you to note in these slides, particularly in the tunics, that's this fragmentary piece here and this fragmentary piece here, and this one, which is a much later example, but I'd just like you to notice the simplicity of the shapes. Most Roman of the Roman wardrobe was made up of a collection of rectangles. So how did women make these shapes fit the bodies? The other thing it's very important to remember is that clothing was made to shape on the loom. This means that thinking about a garment came at the point when you chose your raw material. So before you'd even begun to spin it, you knew what your final garment would be. You didn't weave a block of cloth and then decide what to do with it. So it's a very different dynamic to clothing than medieval or modern tailoring and dress design. I think it's important to remember that. And finally, this slide is just one slide to show you, make the point about color. Dyes are commonly found in archeological textiles and speak to a very colorful cityscape in the ancient world. Polychromy studies on statuary and on buildings have begun to reflect this and we begin to see it more and more in our museums and galleries. But it's very often hard to break through that sort of white marble aesthetic of the classical world. If you could just keep colour, in, particularly for women's dress, in your mind, I think it's a very good start. And to reinforce that, here are some saris. The sari is also a garment that's made to shape on the loom and it's rectangular. It's worn, as you can see from these images here, in a multiplicity of ways. Now, when we talk about ancient clothing, particularly ancient Roman clothing, there's often a debate about whether you can talk about fashion at all because the shapes remain the same over many hundreds of years. Uh, so it's not only the sameness, of the garments, but also their antiquity. And both male and female dress in ancient Rome was made up of a pretty shapeless tunic, either an oblong or a wide oblong. So you created sleeves basically by the fall of the excess of fabric down your shoulders. Uh, and this tunic was covered by some wrap or mantle. These garments had a long history. They're worn by, men, worn by men and women of all classes and all ages across several centuries. 
and this idea of antiquity would suggest there is very little fashion. Now, I'm not going to talk about fashion uh, in this lecture because it is a whole sort of nest of worms, really. Um, but I am going to talk about choice. Um, and whether you equate choice with fashion is a whole other thing. But the sari is also a garment with a thousand years of history. And it's characterized like the Roman pallet and tunic as being woven to shape. But we see in the modern sari, it encompasses many variables in pattern, in weave structure, and these enhance the drape, uh, enhance the strength of the fabric, the weight of the fabric. And like Roman dress, it's given additional shape by the body that wears it, so by the body beneath it. But as it's a living garment, it's possible to track changes in weave, in color, and in draping, elements that are potentially lost to us from antiquity. And there's no other item, as I'm sure you know from this, so this course, that identifies a person so immediately as dress. It plays a major role in the social construction of identity. And at the same time, it provides the outside observer with a method of studying how people interpret a, spe a specific form of culture. We stand, or I stand, outside Indian culture in much the same way as I stand outside Roman culture. In the one case, my own cultural background precludes me from understanding the subtleties of sari style and manners of draping. And in the other, time and the limited nature of the evidence do not allow an insight into how Roman women thought about their clothing. So the sari is a good impetus of ways of thinking about antiquity, I think. Now put this together with the other major external influence on my work, which was a trip to Iran, which I undertook in 2006. This was my first encounter with a society where female dress is prescribed in a way very different to Western Europe. Now, since 2006, there have been many changes and already this analogy may come to be quite dated, particularly given what's going on in Iran at the moment. But the chadur, the all enveloping black um, gown, covers the head, so it can be used to cover the face and covers the body and goes over your clothing, was ubiquitous in the city and in the countryside. But it's not the only form of dress. We saw lots of uh, women wearing trousers and long tunics and headscarves. But even here, you can see in some of these, these are regional versions here where there's a much more sort of flowery decorated chador. And here you can see different forms of head veils. Um, but what it does is it has, like the sari, to an outsider, these garments have a similar effect in that they anonymize the wearer. They hide any attempt at agency or individuality. In Iran, what struck me most was like the sari, women could manipulate their drapery so that it, it did not impinge in any way on their daily activities, at least when out in public. And this is the other big issue that Iran really highlighted for me, is the dichotomy between public and private. In the shops and the markets, when you walk through an Iranian city center, you see this mass of beautiful color and beautiful fabrics. And these, these are clothing fabrics. And when we asked our guide, when do you wear these? She said, well, you wear them in private, of course. You wear them when you're at home with your family or when you're at big events, weddings, etc., cetera, where uh, social segregation takes place anyway. But this is a side of Iranian life that is completely hidden to outsiders. Uh, the implication is that when they're alone and in private or alone with their families or in private, women could choose what they wanted to wear. As an observer of this phenomenon, standing outside the mores of Iranian society with no understanding of the language, it's hard to interpret the different images of women that we were seeing. We had little sense of where these dress choices sat in the moral spectrum that dictates female dress in Iran. 
And today this is changing faster than we can imagine. I have anonymized all these photos uh, given the current situation in Iran. However, like the sari, looking at public and private dress in Iran made me consider my position as a historian looking at Roman female dress. And I've just realized I've gone on so long, I'm gonna to have to speed up a little bit, I'm sorry. So let's look at Roman female dress. The Romans apparently wore some sort of underwear. We have a lot of talk about breastbands, um, but it's unknown whether they wore the equivalent of pants, to be honest. But this, I just put this lovely pair of leather underwear that were found in Roman London a few years ago. But essentially, Roman dress is, uh, for women, is one large tunic covered by a pala, a huge overmantle, which could be pulled up to cover the head. Uh, the fabrics could be made of wool, normally wool, but wool can be spun very, very finely. So your average wardrobe consisted, whatever social class you were, of a tunic and a pallet, an overmantle. If you were an upper class citizen married woman, you might wear the stola. And the stola is uh, an over tunic that goes over the uh, under tunic and under the pala and reaches to the ground. The importance of the stola is it's yet another layer on the body. It's a marker of status. This is why you see it. I've lost my mouse. Why you see it, you can just see the strap lines uh, in, the, in these statues from the Glyptotech in Copenhagen. And I put a little extract from Horace there, which says, in a matrona, one can only see her face because she has the pallor pulled up to cover her body. And for unless she is a catcher, who is a notorious prostitute, her long robe conceals everything else. So the body is completely covered. And for women, the touching of clothing, the lifting of the veil draws attention to the body but it can also stress elegance. It can draw attention to what is hidden. Clutching at clothes suggests refinement, modesty, but also sensuality. And this is the issue, is that women are constantly on that border between modesty and immodesty. And modesty itself is a bit of a paradox, particularly these are images that I show you now of uh, very common statue types. You find them across the Roman Empire and all sorts of women are depicted in this very similar poses, very similar drapery, uh, and they are meant to reflect the virtue of pudicitia, the virtue of modesty and submission. So they are often veiled. You can see in some of them that the pallor is pulled up. You can see that the pallor is very long and wrapped around the body. But at the same time, you can see, oh, there we go. You can see that in some of them, there is a semi-erotic quality. This, the pubic V is outlined. The breasts are very clear. So even though the body is completely wrapped up and covered, there's certainly an element of the woman underneath. So this is an, the idea of modesty is very ambiguous in these uh, statuary. Now, just keep these in mind because I'd like to just return to the pala, which is the overmantle. And if you look in, in these images, what, we've see, what we see is one, two, three, four, five different ways of wearing the pala. So, and this here is a, a drawing of a pala on a pala shaped wall hanging. And this woman from Roman Egypt, she's sort of holding it so it comes from the front to the back. It goes across her arms here. Uh, this is a typical uh, pudicitia pose where the pallor is pulled up over the head and wrapped around the body. And you'll notice that the arms are uh, employed to keep the fabric in place. So again, it, it is, says something about body, body movement and body language. Here, she has got her pallor pulled 
from the front again over her shoulders. This is a much later, this is the projector casket from the fourth century, now in the British Museum. Uh, and again, here we are, two more fourth century. I put this one because this is lovely. The young woman has her simply knotted in the front. And this one is a very decorative pallor pulled over the shoulders. So while you, what we see is the majority of this image, what we know is that women manipulated the pallor to wear it as they could. But like the sari, the pallor, particularly this image, particularly the, these images, for instance, they provide a very unifying idea of what, of the dominant image of what Roman women look like or should look like, idealized. The problem with this evidence is it doesn't let us think about Roman clothing in action. But if you watch women with saris or chadurs walking through the streets, you will see they are constantly adjusting their drapery. It's second nature to be fiddling with your material, shifting it and allowing for movement. At the same time, they can do manual labor wearing these things, wearing these garments without having to constantly adjust them. So I think we need to be very careful about how we choose to read this material. Clothing is a material reality and it needs to be thought of in movement with the body. And there's always potential for the personal, even if it's hard to identify. And we see a little bit perhaps of the personal in this draping of the pallor. So let's go to the actual texts. Um, now, I'd like to say I'm not suggesting that these, uh, let's go back one for a minute. These images look like our fashion plates, but women would have been surrounded by them, okay? If you're walking around with layers of clothes like this, you've got to think about, you've got at least three layers on, maybe four if you're wearing a stola and an under, an under, under tunic, it would probably, all these garments would be made of wool. They would bunch up, they would gather in odd places. So you might constantly find yourself shifting to avoid this sort of bunching up, gathering. It might restrict the way you walk. You might have to walk very upright. You're using your arms literally to hold yourself together. Uh, and you might have to walk with small steps, all of which might be signs of your status and signs of your modesty. It's a bit of a joke in Roman uh, poetry that only the poor or the harried run. So women dressed like this are not expected to hurry anywhere. Again, it tells you something about their status. The other thing I think it would be interesting to think about here, she says, checking the time, sorry, uh, is that how did you assess how you looked? The Romans had face mirrors but they were polished bronze or polished silver. They don't reflect in the same way that we think of as mirrors. They did not have full length mirrors. So how do you assess how you should look and how you do look? Do you rely on your attendants and slaves? Or do you look at these images that surrounded you in the Roman city in public and private contexts and think this is how the clothed body is meant to look? So obviously I'm not suggesting they're fashion plates, but I think there is an idea of idealization that might be internalized here. Uh, and again, here's another issue. This is advice to a matrona from Seneca, who says, if you are a good woman, you want to go out safe from the lust of a seducer, you must go, up, go out dressed up only so far as to avoid unkemptness. So basically just this side of untidiness which of course is not really going to ple please the upper classes. Um, on the other hand, this is the second half of that extract, you could go up out with a face made up to look utterly seductive, naked, hardly less obvious than had you taken off your clothes and given advance warning of the shamelessness in the way she dresses, the way she walks and her appearances. Now this implies that a this is a woman at the other end of the spectrum to the matrona. But I found this lovely example. This is from the Danish National Museum. This is meant to be a statue of Plotina, Trajan's wife. And if you look at it, 
it is expressly showing off the transparency of the material. If you look at here, she has an almost translucent pallor through which you can see the outline of the belt that is doing up her stola underneath. Uh, so, and you have her nipples are very clearly outlined through the sheer fabric. So what does this show? Is this showing the opposite of a matrona? Well, clearly not. This is an idealized statue of an emperor's wife. What it is, is showing off sheer fabrics, uh, whether they be made of wool or they be made of silk, it's showing off really high class fabrics, but it's also showing off the body in between. It's that dynamic between idealization and eroticism that is often present in these statues. And on a very practical level, it's a very clever sculptor showing off his talents, his ability to show these beautiful layers. And this is precisely this sort of mix and match of sources and images and ideas that is the problem with looking at Roman dress. So I'm gonna give you three short literary examples and they'll be shorter than I thought because I'm running out of time. Uh, and they span from the third century before Sorry, Mary, Christ. don't worry about the time. Take okay, the third century worry. BC on to um, uh, the late first century. So we have uh, this example from Theocritus. This is a lovely poem. Uh, it's full of details that just delight the dress historian. But at one point, um, got two women are discussing, they're off to the palace to, or they're off to see um, a festival. So they're dressing up. And Gorgo says, that full length dress really suits you, Praxinoa. How much did it cost you straight off the loom? And Praxinoa says, oh, don't remind me, it costs more than two mina of good money, and I put my heart and soul into the work. Well, it's turned out a success, that you can say. So here is Gorgo, who's bought, um, Praxinoa has bought a garment from the weaver, and then she's brought it home and finished it herself. So here is some sense of agency, some sense of trying to make something personal from that is just a basic shape of garment. Uh, there are some beautiful details in this. We get the idea that uh, clothing, good clothing is kept in a locked chest. The cat has sat in, among the yarn and mucked up all the yarn before it can be spun. Um, it's, oh, Gorgo, in the beginning of this, she complains that her husband brought dirty fleeces home for her to work with, etc. So it's full of lovely little details for a dress historian but it also plays with the idea that women are like-minded, that women are only interested in clothing, in unimportant things. And this is where, the, and that they will spend their husband's money developing their own wardrobes. So it highlights sort of the difficulties of dealing with this. There's also a problem of translation, which I have discussed elsewhere. Uh, again, there are, I found at least five different translations in English of this idyll, where you get a very different um, impression of the importance of the clothing, depending on the translator and how they have played it down. This is translated by my colleague, Professor Graham Shipley, who is uh, versed in Greek dialect. So I'm quite happy with this one. Okay, my next example is from Livy. Uh, first century BC, he writes an account of the Lex Opia and the fact that the women of Rome uh, rebel and they have a series of demonstrations against the Lex, Lex Opia, which had um, denied them the ability to wear purple and gold while the war with Hannibal was going on. And it's put into the mouths of two different ancient Romans, one of whom is uh, Lex Lucas Valerius, and the other one is Cato, well known for his uh, anti-Greek, uh, pro-Roman views. But anyway, Cato argues that when everyone dresses the same, that is, when the purple, without the purple and gold that have been prohibited by the law, all women look the same, rich and poor alike. But the women, he says, respond by saying, well, why should we all look alike? We don't want to all look alike. Why should upper class women not be conspicuous in the wearing of purple of gold? They wish to differentiate themselves from poorer women. 
so Cato argues, and this is often about the argument about women in clothing, he argues from the point of view of extra extravagance. Rich women will want to own what others cannot have, and the poorer women, in order to avoid the shame of poverty, will spend what they or their husbands don't have, trying to emulate the fashions of richer women. This is not an argument that's gone away, it may be familiar to many of you. In response, Valerius says that the law was passed in time of war, and now we have the time of war is gone, and that men have their badges of honor. Um, and for women, he says, their insignia is the elegance of adornment and apparel. They lay aside purple and gold at times of mourning, but they put on their most beautiful clothes and jewelry at times of celebration. And significantly, he says, it is part of the natural order that women adorn themselves. So as presented by Livy, the debate is carefully choreographed to present two opposing views of the debate on female appearance. The tropes here, the expense, the potential for deception, the danger of individuality, the economic risk for the lower orders, are clearly a response to the Augustan situation of Livy's own day, rather than 195 BCE when the debate is set. More significantly, similar themes are picked up and exploited by Seneca and Petronius, by the early church fathers, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, Cyprian and Jerome, and arguably by 18th century fashion theorists like Torsten Veblen and Georg Simmel and arguably even by Pierre Bourdieu in La Différence. The idea that fashion is created by those who can afford it or the upper classes or the haute couture classes, creating a particular image that is then immediately copied in cheaper images by those lower down the social scale is, work, is at work here as the same way that it is still at work in a 21st century Western society. Finally, here is Ovid, my favorite, favorite always. Ovid's advice to courtesans. This is a wonderful text about Roman manners. It's obviously an elegy set as an epididactic text. It deals with the topic of the cultivation of the self in a very high literary manner. And herein lies the joke for the erudite member of Ovid's society, of the audience. Uh, it's written in a high literary manner about a very uh, low class uh, effect. It's advice to young men and young women on how to catch your girlfriend or your, or your mistress. This example is just one that shows you, lists a whole series of colors that are available. Um, he's making the point that, you know, whole uh, estates go to buy these colors. So he has a moralizing layout over this, but I'm just using it to show you the colors that are available. But then he tells women to choose the color that suits their uh, complexion. Choose ones that are sure to please, for not everyone suits every woman. Snow white skins like dark gray colors, dark gray become a briseis, even when she was carried off in her robe, dark gray. The dark of hue like white colors, etc. And he also gives women advice on how to wear their clothes. Let her that is too slender choose garments full of texture, then let her robe hang loosely from her shoulders to give you a fuller figure. If you are a pale woman, adorn yourself with purple stripes. And if you are swarthy, have recourse to the aid of the Farian fish, which I think might be crocodile dung, uh, which was meant to be a good cosmetic for um, whitening the skin. If you've got a poorly formed foot, make sure you wear a nice white sandal and never relieve. If you've got skinny ankles, keep your sandals strapped up. Small pads suit high shoulder blades and a band should surround a narrow chest so you can improve your bust by bulking it up. These are obviously very eclectic choices. Um, we can't know how Roman women responded to any of these. Um, and it's highly debatable how we, far we can shift from Ovid or Theocritus or Livy 
to writing real life. Uh, but if we wish to understand something about Roman women and their attitude to dress, we need to deal with every bit of evidence we can find. We don't know how women responded to those idealized images of statuary that surrounded them. Did they think they were preposterous? Did they think, did they want to try and emulate them? We don't know how they responded to texts like this if they read them. The very basic nature of Roman female dress and its fundamentally simple shaping allowed women a certain freedom about what they chose to outline, what they chose to expose or emphasize. And they had the power to manipulate drapery within their limited wardrobe. And indeed in other parts of the Ars Amatoria, Ovid talks about how women should walk, how they can let their garment fall off their left shoulder and expose their shoulder, et cetera. They can, how they can lift it up when they're walking along the pavement to show off their ankles. So both elegists and satirists talk about artfully arranged drapery that could hide flaws or show off more attractive body parts. And the idea that clothing not held together or it could come adrift uh, is often used to characterize the ideal of mental disarray. If you know your Catullus, uh, when Ar Ariadne is, in Catullus's version of Ariadne abandoned by Theseus, her garments literally fall off her in the same way that her life has fallen apart. Finally, I just want to say a tiny bit about reconstructions. These reconstructions, which are very helpful in ways of thinking about how fabric might actually work and how you might put together these um, wardrobes. These are, these, the three I have in front of you are from a lovely book called La Femme Romaine, which is a, a French book dated to the early 2000s. You can see they have used very modern materials here, um, but also in the book, they talk about how they chose to reconstruct and what they chose to reconstruct. So they've given quite an interesting analysis about the colors they chose, the fabric that they chose and how they did it. And again, we have to think about this when we're thinking about reconstructions. And then I give you a more academic version, if you like, now it's a bit insulting to the previous one, sorry. Um, this is the Dama di Baza, which is a first century BC figure uh, that was the costume was recreated as part of the dress ID project, um, which ran till uh, 2005 across Europe. It was a European funded dress project. And it was recreated, making a series of choices again about how to design the fabric, uh, how to use the colors, how many layers of fabric you can see. They, they've imagined a, a white. Uh, undergarment here, just visible here on the statue. They spent a lot of time trying to recreate this drapery here, finally worked out the shape of it. They timed the tablet woven borders and they took hours and hours. So again, it was very interesting in terms of how long it makes to take, take to that. They also developed a protocol for, for reconstructions, which is, possible to read about, I won't go on about it here, but basically it's sort of, if you, if you want to reconstruct for research purposes, i.e. use uh, as near the material, the tools and the method of making as possible, that's the most expensive and the ideal. And then there is the making them for educational purposes and uh, interest, interest purposes, which is a different sort of level of reconstruction. But again, reconstructions do help us think about how drapery worked, how it felt on the body, how people could have moved in it. Finally, I've got to the end. <laughs> the experiential nature of Roman clothing is largely lost to us. The surviving evidence of literature and iconography leaves us with images that are primarily public and idealizing. Material culture might be the best way into these things. But women made and wore clothes. They chose patterns, textiles, according to their or their husband's resources to create a look, even if it was within a fairly limited wardrobe, which conformed more or less to the sartorial and social ideals of their time. But the fact that the clothed female body was a topic around which male authors could construct a discourse, moralizing or eroticizing, 
suggests that women were acting as agents, were aware of the potential of dress and adornment and well able to use it for a multiplicity of purposes. In discussion of the upper class, there is a sense of internal composition, competition, a dress image understood by peers who were able to read the subtle differences such as textile qualities, natures of dyes, draping, size of palas and togas, as well as additional accessories of gems and jewelries and footwear, which I have not mentioned here. Uh, so I think this is a very large um, subject and it's a very wide ranging subject that it's very difficult to get to the bottom of. I just hope I've given you a little bit of taste of it here. I realize I have spoken almost primarily about the elite. There is a whole different lecture to be had on those who are outside the elite. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mary. And please everyone join me in giving Mary a, a Zoom applause. Oh my goodness, I can see you all now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Um, let's see. Um, there we go. I just uh, put us on a panel view, but thank you so much for this inspiring, really, really thought provoking uh, presentation. And I, I do realize you were asked to explain a very large subject in a in a short amount of time. Sorry, but, sorry. but this no, this very was quick. brilliant, sorry. really enjoyable. So please, everyone, we have um, at least 20, 25 minutes for questions and discussion. So if you have a question or a comment, please go ahead, either send a message to me in the chat or raise a virtual hand or even a physical hand, um, whatever works for you. Um, and just why everyone uh, come back to the Zoom room and, and think about the questions. I, I've been writing questions down and I, I don't think we'll have time for all of them. But one thing that I found really, really interesting um, was this aspect about um, the shape of the garment, and and you you showed us this uh, this quote from uh, from Theocritus about buying um, a fabric straight off the loom, and and I was just wondering if you've I'm sure you've given this thought how it would have worked in practice uh, with with relation to sort of individual fit and size and and height and so I mean I. You stress to us that these are very sort of square garments, but would you then buy a woven piece off the loom, as it says in the text, and then adjust it to your to your personal features, or was it more common to do your own weaving? Uh, I, I, I well, there's lots of questions there, but I think it yes, was, it was probably very common to do your own weaving. Okay, so you could weave uh, the size that would suit yourself. Okay, and. Um, but it takes a long time. So it takes a very long time to, uh, especially on a warp weighted loom, it takes a very long time to weave uh, a tunic length. Uh, that again, that's another paper. But uh, if you could buy off from a professional weaver, you could presumably buy a width because it went from selvage to selvage. So uh, finished edge to finished edge that might suit you. Uh, but you might choose by the quality of the material, you might choose by the quality of the weave, is it a tight weave or a loose weave, depending on what you wanted. Unfortunately, we just don't have that information. We don't, um, I gave a bit of a tongue in cheek talk about shopping in Rome recently. Um, and it's very frustrating because we have evidence of people who look like they probably sell clothes, you know, by in, in terms of their names, their occupational names, but we're not quite sure what they do. So it's very difficult to know how you might acquire your wardrobe. There's mm. lots of little bits of sources. There's a beautiful letter, which I love, which is fifth century AD. And it's the uh, Synesius of Cyrene, who's a sort of bishop, warlord, Bit of a mad person wandering around you know in north africa but he writes to his brother and he says if that attic uh peddler comes through this year make sure you get me some summer cloaks so again there's a, you know it's just a tiny bit of information about how you might buy your things but yeah, yeah. that's why i love that little bit of theocritus because it just sort of makes something real that you you we just don't have evidence for anywhere else no absolutely thank you yeah. 
Uh, Stephanie, I could see you'd written a, a message in the chat. Do you want to to say it yourself? Would you mind reading it for me? No, not at all. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, okay, so Stephanie writes that this was a fantastic talk. I agree. Thank you so much. Have become very undone wearing a beautiful silk sari. Use uh, a fibula, aka large safety pin, was necessary to remain um, modestly covered or dressed. Uh, just querying the use of cotton, plants introduced to Egypt from India as an alternative to linen during Roman times. Layered wool garments must have been awful on a sweltering July, August day, yes, but nice in cooler European winter climes. Mesopotamian draped women's clothing bears strong resemblance to sari too, with decorative borders. Oh, that's a good point. Over the shoulder style and what looks like large sequins added for additional bling. I'm more familiar with ancient Egyptian women would also have draped rectangular cloth. Uh, methods of pleating is interesting. Experimental archaeology investigation undertaken recently. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt Stephanie's uh, comment here, but I just want to mention that the first speaker in our lecture series, uh, Rosalind Jansen, who's an Egyptologist, is actually an expert on ancient Egyptian pleating. Just so her work is recommended on that. Um, in modern Egypt, wearing a colorful cotton jalabeya, kaftan and scarf makes a Western woman feel comfortable and accepted. In public, older males spit... Uh, like camels. <laughs> oh, ferrant fish might be referring to the Nile bulti species. Oh, the pharaoh's fish. Ah, oh, thank oh, you. I'm really sorry if I mangled that for you, Stephanie, but I it's hope it was all right. Fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just thinking maybe the the ferric and the pharaonic yeah. in translation got a bit. It might have done. You're quite right. I'm I'm following, you know, I'm following the commentator in the text. So um, I've not followed it through mm -hmm. myself, but thank you very much for that reference. Yeah. Um, the the bulti fish features quite strongly in Egyptian iconography and jewellery. Oh, right. It's like a type of catfish. Okay. Whatever, it doesn't um, sound great as a cosmetic. Um, well, <laughs> one never knows what else it might have contained. Yeah. But... Um, I don't think it was very edible unless it was by very poor people. Mm. Interesting. That's 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 from an yeah. Egyptologist yeah. type. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, and Peter Schertz uh, has a, a question about looms. Peter, would you like to ask the question yourself? Sure. So I know nothing about this, and it was a fascinating talk. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm curious about the width of the looms and, you know, how wide of a fabric you could get with them. And I've often wondered about shaping on the looms because, you know, when I've read about Roman togas, there's a kind of arc on them. There's that cotton hem, which would leave a lot of loose threads, I would think, and weird hemming. <laughs> I mean, I saw a little bit, but not a lot. So, <laughs> uh, okay. Now, I'm not a I'm not a textile archaeologist, as I made the point, but I have yeah. done some work on this, um, particularly on the making of the toga. If a toga was made to shape, you need a loom that's nearly three meters wide. So it begs a lot of questions. It begs a lot of questions. Where do you find your three meter wall in a Roman house to lean it against? How tall is it? Um, from uh, sets of loom weights that are found, you know, if they are, if we're lucky enough to find them in situ, and most of these I have to say are not Roman, they're either post-Roman or Hellenistic, but obviously a loom of sort of uh, one and a half to two meters wide would not have been unusual. Okay. So uh, again, you've got to think about space, where these things are in the house. It, it, it brings with it a whole series of other questions. Uh, but these are made to shape on the loom and some of them are very wide. Some of them are easily two, two and a half meters wide. And, they, and they've got selvages down both sides. So they're clearly made to shape on a loom. 
uh, uh, John Peter Wilde, I think, argues that uh, in, Ro in Egypt, you, you still see the ground loom, you see the upright loom, and by the um, Roman Imperial period, we've seen, we see the upright loom uh, without weights coming into the Roman production, but they're still weaving to shape. You, you don't get weaving bolts of cloth from which you cut shapes till much later on. So it is a particular dynamic in terms of making clothes and thinking about clothing. It imposes sort of um, decisions from very early on in the process, you know, as opposed to, you know, today when you go into the, the drapers and you feel some nice fabric and think, oh, I could make a jacket from that. So completely, you know, we start the other end. We start with the sheep and we go, mm, nice, very fine, lovely. I'll have a toga made of that. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's a wonderful image. Um, just to follow up with a quick question on that, there is there anything archaeologically that would suggest workshops of a particular size to accommodate looms that wide, or is that just an impossible? I, I think it, uh, you've, I've got to dig in my memory bank now, but I think um, the best analogies we have are uh, carpet weavers in Egypt and North Africa uh, and in Turkey. I think they're the best modern analogies we have. I don't think we have. Uh, and there's a lot of Egyptian papyri which suggest weavers work well, are about weavers workshops and the product of weavers workshops. But whether the actual physical archaeological remains, I'm afraid I just don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Mary Jane, Kyler, please go ahead. Thank you. I'd like to also extend my thanks for that wonderful talk. And um, thank, you. thank you to Anna Katrina for always putting together such wonderful series and having this ability to draw gems from all over the world. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was wondering about very early on in your talk, you showed um, one of the so-called bikini girls from the mosaic uh, of the Piazza Armarina in Sicily. Mm -hmm. And I know that, of course, there's so many problems with um, time and space. You know, this is a late antique mosaic, fourth century. Um, but I was wondering if what sort of research or studies or even thoughts you have around the outfits they're wearing as um, are these to be seen as uh, exercise clothing, underwear, underwear as exercise clothing, or other options that you may have um, already developed? Well, it's a really good question because they are, they're really uh, contentious in some ways because there they are on the floor, uh, obviously exposed. Uh, and it's again, I think this whole justification of sort of eroticism, strength, modesty, you can, it's uh, a bit like the, the little Venus from Pompeii who's bending over and tying her sandal. She has a sort of gold, a drawn on gold breastband. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, the erotic parts of the body are not exposed, but obviously these are women in states of undress. So, it may be women exercising, then I think you'd have to ask questions about their status. The other thing I, I think is very interesting about the Piazza Armarina mosaics is they are completely overused as examples of Roman underwear. Um, mm -hmm. Because we have so few examples of Roman underwear. Uh, and they are rarely questioned is uh, the point of view of the viewer. Who was looking at these things and what were they thinking? Were they, is it because they're in a sort of semi-gymnastic stroke ritual context that they are acceptable? Um, so I'm, all I can do is ask you more questions, I'm afraid. I don't, I don't have an opinion on them. Okay. Except that the first time I saw them, I was, I was surprised. Yeah, they almost, the first time I saw them, I remember thinking, oh, that's gotta be a fake. 
<laughs> well, know? yes. But it's there not. Is, it's is, not. Is, but that was my there, first thought. There is, um, it's, a, it's a bit like some of the mosaics uh, at Ravenna that were redone in the 19th century. You know, you can suddenly, once you've got your eye in, you can suddenly see those bits. Um, yeah. But I've, I've, I haven't heard anybody claim they're actually a fake. I don't think they are. No. Um, I was uh, in a small argument recently with a tour guide in Herculaneum who, who was talking to my group about how they, uh, the ancient Roman women didn't exercise at all. And that it just was not a thing. And I said, well, you know, what about this, the Piazza Armarina uh, mm -hmm. mosaics? And he said, um, well, uh, you know, what, what this could be is they could be, um, you know, uh, like gymnasts or not gymnasts, but like performers and they're, they're rehearsing a mm. performance. I said, okay, I, you know, I take your point, but I'm not going to completely give up the idea that some women may have engaged in exercise. And then um, the other week I was reading, I was reading, uh, I think it's book eight, I can't remember, somewhere in, in Homer's Odyssey. And um, a group of women with their princess are out um, doing laundry and they decide to play ball and they, they take mm. off their clothes and start playing ball and they're tossing the ball around and it doesn't say what they're wearing and so I know okay we're dealing with very disparate evidence here okay no, but <laughs> and I... yet and yet we take what we can get and so mm. I've just been tossing these things around in my yeah. own mind and then you showed that mosaic and... yeah that's, uh, I think that's a very, that's uh, now Sika, isn't it? I think that's a really interesting mm -hmm. point. Um, you're right, they do take their clothes off because they're, and they're right, they're on, they're on the beach, aren't they, washing the clothes? Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because I, I rarely visualize that, but once you start visualizing it you, and think about the practicalities of what, uh, the implications of what Homer might have been implying, it, mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting. Yeah. Mm. well thank good question. you thank you good for thought <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you both uh stephanie had a question in the chat as well about dating if any of the garments you've looked at uh, have been either c14 or stable light isotope dated uh i think they all have and i couldn't uh quote you them at the moment the um the leather underpants which were found in for in roman london and um they're always they're always sold in the paper as you know obviously belonging to a female gladiator because apparently we're very keen on female gladiators in Rome and London, but you know we just don't know. Um, and I think they date. I think they're second or third century, but don't quote me on that. Yeah. Do you remember just by any chance what the context was for where they were found? No, I can't. I do know I can't remember at all. I'm ashamed to say I should never have put them in. I should have looked them up again <laughs> before I put them in. Sorry. Oh, they are very spectacular. Yeah, they are, yeah. <laughs> but um, we have a few minutes left in case anyone would uh, would like to make a comment or ask another question. I've I've been wondering about something and maybe it was just a detail, but but you showed us that beautiful statue, I think, from the Glyptotech of uh, Plotina, mm. uh, the one that was very sheer in the fabric. Yeah. And I noticed that this must have been her tunic. Uh, it was kept together in the sleeves with something that looked like buttons. Oh, yes. Well, that's that's there's a whole debate on that. You get these sort of gap sleeved tunics. Now, they're not buttons because there's no buttonholes. No. OK, but they are some form of fastening and you see them, you see them on lots of statuary, uh, but we don't have any sort of material evidence to show how these might have been fastened. I mean, they could have been, you know, just sewn together with uh, something decorative. You know, we talked a little bit before somebody mentioned, or I think Stephanie mentioned sequins and things. And if mm. you think of um, some of the sort of little tiny gold ornaments you find that may have been part of clothing, uh, they may that may have been that they may have been um, I'm, I'm showing you as if you can actually see but look it may have been uh, twists of fabric you know just tied around it's uh, there's all sorts of things that they could have been uh, unfortunately you can rarely get close enough to have a really good look but then even if you get close enough you're looking at the sculptor's 
I view of this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. At least from what I was able to see on your image, they 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 look very defined in a way. But but you're right. They could just as easily yeah. be little twists of fabric. Yes. It's um, very it's very difficult to see in any yeah. way. And uh, they are, if you know, if, uh, dress historians debate these quite often. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the um, the Mesopotamian ones are very often in the shape of rosettes, little little daisy like oh, flowers. Yeah. Um, kind of thumb thumb shaped, sized. Yeah. Um, and obviously found in the in the archaeological context, one they loose. Mm, yeah. But but they're finding heaps of them around an excavated body. Yeah. Mm. Yes. I and know. and and it's only when you actually go to the, I don't know if you've got them in your background there. Um, Ashu Banipal's wife. There's a panel in the British Museum, I think. Yes. If you look at her sort of sorry type thing, that's got little yeah. bitties on it that that yeah. that look as though it could be these these sequins. Mm. Um, I'm aware of fiance sequins that were found in the Egyptian burial context. Um, uh -huh. Also in the shape of flowers and also in the shape of amulets, but not so much the fancy gold, but 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 the more peasant type mm. glass pottery yeah. type. Um, I think there are a whole lot in the Petrie Museum, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, fascinating. But I could imagine really that if it's a nice faience make and if you have enough of beautiful. them, that it's it beautiful. would have been really striking. It would have been colorful as well. Yeah. If you, if you think of faience was actually quite brightly colored. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping to get there in, in, in January next year and see for myself. Um, and I've just remembered the chicken was known as the Pharaoh's bird when it was introduced from, from Mesopotamia. Yeah. Excuse me. So that's that's maybe <laughs> more me. <laughs> of the pharaohs, the pharaohs fish, along yeah. the same lines. Did you say the pharaohs boot? Bird. The pharaohs chicken. The yeah. it was known as the pharaohs bird. Amazing. <laughs> that's a random <laughs> bit of information for today. <laughs> um, you really want that to come up in a pub quiz, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I'll remember um, it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I just want your your email address. I want to take a. I've I've I've, I've got some um, examples of the of the Balti fish. All right. Um, oh, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> I did my my masters on symbolism and iconography of Egyptian women's headdresses. Right. Which is how I ended up going down all these weird rabbit holes. <laughs> well. Stephanie, including can... including mummifying a chicken, which is why I know the render. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't allowed to include that in my thesis. <laughs> Stephanie, I've sent you my email address. So if you don't mind sending me a message, I can okay. get you two in touch. Yeah, we'll do. Okay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I wonder if it's okay if I ask you one last question before we let you have a break, yeah. Mary. But it was uh, also, I think, back towards the beginning of your talk, you mentioned this thing about fashion and whether we can even talk about fashion uh, in the ancient world, or at least there was a choice. Um, and then it, it made me think about hair and hairstyles. Because, <laughs> and I know that's, that's probably three talks in itself. <laughs> um, but, um, but I was just, what are your thoughts about, I mean, the sort of the relationship between hairstyle and clothing? Would would you say that the hairstyle is the bit that changes and the clothing stays more or less the same, or is that going too far? I I think that's probably in general true, but and I, but I do believe in fashion. Mm. I do, I do think these women were making changes, um, and I think the fact that it's such a worry to all those male authors is you know there's got to be something going on. Um, and I, I actually agree with Livy, you know, I think we're hardwired for adornment and, mm. you know, as a, as a species. So it's a, it's a rather broad statement, but, you know, I think we are. Um, so I don't see why 
it wouldn't happen. And I think there were, if you were in the cities, you had lots of different things, you know, especially if you're in Rome, you had visiting, people visiting from other cultures, you would see different colors, you would see different clothing, you would see the checks that the Gauls wore, there all these things that would give you choices if you mm. could afford it. I think money has a lot to do with it. I think if you're at the other end of the social scale, you were probably lucky if you even had a change of clothing. Yeah. So, um, but I think if we're talking about that elite, certainly they had choices. And if you, if you read the, um, a lot of the denigration of Roman emperors uh, is about those that don't dress properly. Uh, you know, and I think um, I've argued and uh, people like Birrit Hildebrand have argued that uh, what they're doing actually at the very top of the social scale is exercising their choice and breaking the rules. They can afford the silks, the bright colors. So why aren't they, why can't they wear them? And they, they are in power and they wear them. So I think that, that if you sort of unpick the discourse that's going on, you can certainly see fashion. To go back to your question about hair, sorry, diverse. Um, yes, I think there are lots of different changes of hairstyle. Um, if you know Janet Stevens' YouTube, if you don't, check it out. I do, I love it. Yes, she has worked out how you can do most of these hairstyles with very little additional uh, hair pieces or equipment. Uh, and certainly with a bit of needle and thread, you can create most of those hairstyles. It's very handy to have slaves, but you know, yes. you can create them, yeah. <laughs> See, I was lucky enough, uh, Janet Stevens once did a demonstration at the, um, the Society of Biblical Literature. Yeah. Uh, we had a session on on hair in ancient Rome where she she was there and that she was actually styling hair while there were lectures going on. Yeah. And then at the end, we, we saw uh, a finished uh, hairdo, which was beautiful. And it was yeah. uh, uh, one thing that sort of scared me a little bit to death was the um, idea of these overheated thongs. Yes. Uh, and, and um, how yeah. they will make you go it's hairless quite hair. quickly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, fascinating. Mm. Last chance to make a comment or um, or ask a question for Mary before we, we let her have her Friday afternoon in peace. <laughs> I see similarities between Greco-Roman hairstyles and almost morals and dress codes with the Victorian era. Mm. I I would agree with you. I think this is, it might be because all those uh, moralizing Victorians were brought up on the classics. So mm -hmm. they are carefully absorbing all those ideas that have already sort of come through the early Christian fathers, et cetera. So I think there's, there is a continuum there, definitely. Just in the and way- all those, And all those white marble statues in great houses all, all over England. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Well. Before I um, ask you to to join me in thanking uh, uh, Mary again for her brilliant talk and, and our discussion, I'm just going to make a little bit of advertisement for our next lecture, which will be in uh, roughly three weeks time. It's Friday, December the 2nd at 3 p.m. local time in Oslo again. And there we have um, a duo uh, lecturing for us. It's Dr. Agnes Garcia Ventura and Dr. Mireya Lopez Bertran. Uh, uh, both a seriologist and expert on a uh, Punic culture, um, both from, from Spain. And um, the lecture is called Dress to Sound? Question mark, an approach to dress and attire of female musicians in Phoenician and Punic contexts. Uh, and, and basically what they're going to talk about is the dress of female musicians and dancers based on uh, Punic uh, and Phoenician vase paintings. Uh, I think this one is going to be uh, brilliant as well. So do join us for that if you're free on fri Friday the 2nd of December. And then, Mary, thank you so much for being with us today. This was really, really delightful. Um, <laughs> thank you. And thank you all for coming. And I wish you all a wonderful weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.